So this is our first in-person conference in several years, and we hope you will take the opportunity during the breaks and at the reception to talk with, the, with our distinguished visitors, our professional experts, and each other over the course of the next two days. We are also hoping you'll ask lots of questions um, of our speakers, and for that we have roving mics, I think, and we're not using Slido, so you have to be brave and talkative. But I already understand that apparently you are a talkative group, so we won't have any problems on that front. Finally, just to let you know that we're recording these sessions so that our own Master of Public Policy students here at the University of Auckland can engage with your insights um, over the coming year. So now we're getting underway. The trans-Tasman relationship and our two countries' respective engagement with the broader Asia-Pacific and Latin America region is the theme of the next two days. And in this opening panel, we are focusing on the trans-Tasman component, the history and contemporary dimensions of this long-standing relationship, and the similarities and differences, opportunities and tensions that underpin how we connect with our trading partners in the broader region. Over time, there have been ebbs and flows in the degree of political and policy connectedness, although growing differences in sizes and scale have meant the relationship has been taken to be more important to New Zealand than Australia. For the most part, studies of the trans-Tasman relationship have focused on foreign affairs, defence and trade. A theme that runs through these works is that the exogenous factors that the exogenous factors that pull these geographically contiguous countries together overshadow the asymmetrical relationship and the inevitable tensions that arise as a result. These events are not devoid of culture and politics. Political leaders on both sides of the Tasman have, at key moments, chosen to accentuate the asymmetry to advance their country's interests as they see them. As such, asymmetry does not itself infer unequal power in the world of politics, domestic or international. What did initially bind the Australian colonies and New Zealand together in the early 1870s was their collective interest in breaking the British government's control over trade treaties and tariff policies. And once that break was achieved, there was some small amounts of progress on preferential entry to each other's markets. Fast forward 100 years and we see a different political and trade policy landscape. Australia has an important ally and trade partner. The two economies established the Gold Standard Trade Agreement, CER, and a trans-Tasman travel arrangement. There is a recognition on both sides of the Tasman that strong people-to-people -people connections matter for business, policy, and regional stability. So we begin this morning with a focus on the trans-Tasman connections and the connections between geopolitics and trade. And to discuss this topic, and no doubt much more, we have two distinguished scholars whose expertise on this topic will set the scene for our more detailed discussions of trade across the region over the next two days. You can find their full bios in your handbook, but for now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Alan Gingell, who is the National President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, an Honorary Professor at the Australian National University, and who has had a long career in, the Australia, in Australian foreign policy and is a distinguished author of a number of volumes. Hamish McDougall is Executive Director of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs. Fare, tafai, a mahi e Aotearoa. Previous to this, he completed a PhD in International History at the LSE with research publications, higher education teaching and online course design experience. So each speaker is going to talk on their areas of expertise for about 15 minutes each, and then we're going to take questions from you. So pens out and welcome. Me first. Um, uh, look, thanks very much um, uh, to uh, Jennifer and to the Public Policy Institute for the invitation. 
uh, to be here. One of my rules of life is if you're ever invited to visit New Zealand, go. And um, uh, last time I tried, tried to come here for a, a conference organised by the uh, New Zealand uh, uh, China uh, Business Foundation, um, I got COVID uh, two days before I left. So it's, it's great to finally be here. Um, it's also great to be on the panel with, uh, with Hamish because the Australian Institute of International Affairs and the New Zealand Institute have a long, um, well, sprang from the same seed and, uh, and have, have a long relationship. Uh, one point I've often um, made about Australia and, and New Zealand is that the principal difference between us as countries is that Australians feel uh, strategically vulnerable and economically secure and New Zealanders feel economically vulnerable and strategically secure. And an awful lot uh, has followed from that and an awful lot of the way in which we, different ways in which we uh, see the world uh, springs from us, from it. If you'd uh, given uh, an Australian a blank sheet of paper and said to them, design a global system which, would su which suits you, Australia, perfectly, you would have come up, uh, or he or she would have come up with something that looked remarkably like the world in the second half of the 20th century. A close, trusting relationship uh, with the most powerful state in the world, the United States, uh, a supporting set of rules which gave order uh, to, that, uh, to that world. It was incredibly easy for Australia to say that we support a rules-based order because that order was basically set by us and our mates. Uh, and thirdly, a deep economic complementarity with the fastest growing countries in the world. First Japan and then Korea and then China in agriculture. And then when agriculture um, uh, started to, to flatten out in resources and energy, and then finally in, in, uh, in services. So, um, you know, uh, you know, Australia was, uh, you know, struck gold in the second half of the uh, 20th century. But that has now, uh, that has now changed. Um, and it began changing around the end of the first decade of this, uh, of uh, the 20, 21st century, around the time of the global financial crisis. Both the United States and China, which in America's case since the Second World War, in China's case since the beginning of the reform program under Deng Xiaoping, had been status quo powers, uh, suddenly both changed uh, to being non-status quo powers. The United States came to the conclusion that the investment which it, which it had made in the international system was no longer delivering the dividends which it, uh, which it needed, wanted, in terms of uh, American uh, uh, jobs and so on. So that gave us first the Trump administration and, uh, and then continued with, uh, with Joe Biden, whose uh, who's foreign policy for the middle class is basically America first with better manners. Uh, uh, on China's side, uh, it was no longer content to be a responsible stakeholder, uh, in Bob Zillick's words, in a system that someone else had designed. It came to the end of, uh, of Deng Xiaoping's famous hide your capabilities and, uh, and bide your time Mantra that was a, that was inevitable. I mean, it's hard to hide when you're the uh, second largest economy in the uh, uh, in in the world. 
But the Chinese uh, decided that they wanted a bigger say in, uh, in how the world was organised, and Xi Jinping, uh, of course, was a you know, principal manifestation um, of, of all that. Um, uh, in, in the case of the United S States, suddenly things which we'd begun in Australia to take for granted, like a commitment to free and open trade, uh, started to uh, started to shift. Uh, because I'm extremely nerdy and interested in these things, I've I've read um, recently the, uh, the the communique issued at the end of the OSMIN Australia U.S. ministerial uh, meeting. Normally, in those long documents which set out what each government uh, believes uh, about the world, you get to paragraph 26 or something, and there's a, there's a paragraph which says that, uh, you know, ministers uh, endorsed, uh, uh, ministers uh, expressed their support for a free and open international uh, trading system. Um, poof, disappeared, evaporated, no longer, no, no, no longer there. Really, really strange, I'm not even quite sure whether the people who are writing the communiques uh, um, uh, have noticed it. I, 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 th I think they have, because apparently it was impossible to get lines like that into a communique under the Trump administration, it hasn't been reasserted. But that's the sort of, the sort of shift uh, um, that, that, we're, that we're beginning to say, and that's just a manifestation of a, a broader change in the, um, in the global order. So, China, United States, both change. Life becomes much more difficult for, uh, for Australia. For 30 years, Australian Prime Ministers, when having microphones shoved in their, their face and asked about problems uh, with China or the, or the United States, would say, Australia does not have to choose between our alliance with the United States and our deep economic relationship with China. Don't have to choose, don't have to choose. Uh, that uh, was repeated by, I think, every uh, uh, Prime Minister leading up uh, to and including uh, Turnbull bef before the change. Uh, however, you can't say that anymore. The choices are coming at us um, daily and, uh, and, from, uh, and from all directions. Um, and the choice that Australia made was not, uh, was not uh, uh, difficult. Um, as I said, strategically vulnerable, economically secure, Australia went for the response to strategic vulnerability and in support for Quad, the Quad and the um, uh, AUKUS uh, agreement, it was, um, it, it was pretty clear which way we, we were going. Other events in the world since then reinforced this. Um, uh, the, the experience of COVID uh, underlined the importance of uh, security of supply chains, and that uh, that uh, commenced a new co uh, conversation. Um, China's openness came under question after after COVID, and the Ukraine war simply reminded everyone of uh, that <clears throat> whatever we might have thought. Uh, conventional warfare between major states was still possible and the links between, or the, the parallels between uh, Taiwan and, uh, and, uh, and Ukraine uh, became clearer and the sort of idea that the world was engaged in a struggle between autocracies and, and democracies uh, took, took hold. You can see how deeply this lies in, um, in the Australian political uh, uh, psyche in the speed with which the Labor opposition at the time, uh, uh, fearful of being wedged, 
uh, on the issue endorsed almost immediately the um, uh, the idea of um, of uh, AUKUS. Uh, sorry, um, yes, AUKUS. Um, so the Albanese government came to power about a, a, a year ago. Many differences in in foreign policy. It put much more weight on ideas of national identity. Um, it's uh, Penny Wong in uh, an unparalleled, I think, um, uh, uh, set of uh, set of non-stop uh, visits has engaged in uh, in respectful listening. I think those, if you did a sort of word cloud of things that Australian foreign policy people have said, respectful listening would uh, be right at the uh, at the centre. Not being Scott Morrison has helped them uh, a lot, uh, both with uh, with France and uh, with the Pacific, and with putting relations with China onto a more even uh, uh, keel. But so far, at least, we haven't seen any sort of fundamental change in the overall direction of Australian uh, policy. And New Zealand, of course, has been sub subjected to the same uh, pressures and, and to more in, uh, in some ways. So it's, it's more important than ever, I think, that Australia and New Zealand uh, work together. Uh, that doesn't mean having the same, uh, having the same uh, policies. We are very different countries and those differences are important not only to ourselves but in, but to the way we can we can both act in the world New Zealand is a Pacific country Australia is a neighbor of the Pacific uh, but a multicultural country in the way we sort of uh, uh, interpret ourselves maintaining those differences is important um, uh, I'm about to say something which is uh, uh, which would uh, no doubt horrify my uh, colleagues in the Australian uh, government, but but one of the one of the differences I think is that uh, Australia describes its strategic environment as the Indo-Pacific. I think that makes extraordinarily good sense for Australia if you. If you are an Australian government or concerned about the protection of Australia, you look at a map <clears throat> and you see that on one side of Australia is the Indian Ocean and on the other side is the Pacific and the whole notion of the Indo-Pacific becomes, uh, becomes important. <clears throat> In New Zealand's case, I, I can't for the life of me see um, anything other than an Asia-Pacific uh, um, environment. Uh, but the problem is that Indo-Pacific has taken on normative um, um, sort of uh, uh, implications and uh, and meanings in the way people uh, people talk about it because it's a way of bringing India into the competition with uh, with uh, China and the US. But if I were uh, if I were New Zealand, I think India is important, but it's India's entry into the Asia Pacific. Which, uh, which is the, the important thing, thing for you. Anyway, uh, long may the differences uh, continue, um, but uh, we are always going to be better off working together and I can't think of a single issue of importance in the, in the, uh, uh, in the Pacific over my lifetime where coordination between New Zealand and Australia has not delivered us better outcomes than, uh, than working alone. Thanks, Jim. Can I go to Katoa? Uh, I thought I'd stand up here just so I can... Uh, shuffle my notes a little bit easier. Um, and thank you very much to Jennifer for inviting me to, to talk. I must say it's uh, very flattering to, to be with you and Alan uh, on the same uh, panel, particularly Alan, the, the sort of uh, doyen of, of uh, 
um, Australian foreign policy, but uh, I will nonetheless uh, give it a shot. And obviously the, the brief is to talk about uh, geopolitics and how that kind of affects the, the trans-Tasman relationship. And if you'll allow me a little bit of leeway to that, I, I was quite keen to talk to kind of set that um, relationship and those, those geopolitics and historical context partly because I'm a historian. I've been uh, researching these aspects of New Zealand's foreign and, and trade policy for the last few years. Uh, but also, I think more importantly, I think uh, an understanding of that history can potentially benefit the, the current debate um, uh, about uh, where to next um, that, that we're going to have here for the next uh, couple of days. So there's kind of three aspects I was going to talk about. The first is economic diversification. The second is... New Zealand's response to, to great power competition and what was in the 20th century known as the, the Cold War. And the third aspect is look, look a little bit into um, the history of the trans-Tasman um, relationship, closer economic relations and so forth. So beginning with economic diversification, um, what I mean by that is, is the process uh, by which New Zealand went from being uh, heavily dependent and connected, economically connected, and culturally, you would say, in the middle of the 20th century, um, where around half of its exports uh, went to Britain and in, in some of the key industries like dairy and, and um, meat, it was up, up around 85, 90%. To the situation we have now, whereby um, uh, our, our economy, our export markets are much more diversified and varied and, and focused on uh, Australia and, and um, Asia Pacific, as, as, uh, as Alan has, has outlined. So um, I think there's, there's some perhaps misconceptions about how this process played out for New Zealand. And, and two of the misconceptions, I would say, are that um, it happened quickly. It was a sudden kind of um, transfer of focus away from Britain. Um, and, and the second one, that it was really caused by Britain's entry into the European community in, in 1973. There's kind of this idea that most overnight New Zealanders woke up in a cold sweat thinking, ah, we've lost our, our export markets, we're going to be cut off, um, and we need to um, uh, find new markets for our products in um, uh, closer to home in, in the Asia-Pacific area. But I would argue that the idea of New Zealand's economic diversification has a much longer history and probably has more to do with the Great Depression. That kind of links to what Alan was saying about um, New Zealand's economic insecurity, perhaps. And that the first Labour government at that time, under Michael Joseph Savage, Walter Nash, etc., actually um, thought that New Zealand was too dependent on, economically dependent on Britain at the time and tried to diversify. And the reason that that diversification didn't really happen was the conflict of the Second World War, which dragged New Zealand back into the uh, closed markets around the world and, and kind of dragged New Zealand back into the, the British orbit. And uh, it kind of speaks to a broader point that I'm going to make, that um, Second World War and the subsequent conflicts in the Cold War actually didn't help New Zealand's diversification to, to any great extent, and I, um, I'm going to show, um, I think, why why that's relevant. Um, the, the other point I think it's important to talk about economic diversification in the current context is because there is some discussion about whether, this discussion in New Zealand, I'm sure it's Australia, certainly the US, um, about economic dependence on China. Um, and I, want to, I don't want to um, stretch the comparison between Britain and, and China too much, but um, hopefully what I'll have to say has some, some kind of um, relevance. Um, the, um, the, fa the fact that New Zealand's diversification has been talked about for, for kind of nearly 100 years or perhaps more can suggest that it's not particularly easy, and I think that's, that's worth um, thinking about in, in the current debate. Another aspect of diversification is that it, it um, quite often followed similar patterns, and what I mean by that is, is you know, through the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, a number of the industries that were held up as success stories in New Zealand's diversification, new export industries like horticulture or tourism or wine, for example, quite often counted uh, Britain as the top one, two markets, which goes to show that these, these patterns run deep. Um, and that they kind of run deep um, and, and, and can be hard to sort of change course in other ways too. 
um, the, the, the kind of diversification of New Zealand's um, meat industry into the Middle East in the 1970s, for example, which was held up as something of a success story until um, the Iran uh, revolution, was actually driven by um, British investment um, uh, into cold store facilities, uh, sort of British-owned shipping um, uh, companies. So it, it may be interesting to think about the comparisons there, you know, if we are trying to diversify um, and have a sort of broader trade portfolio, um, uh, that may still require some uh, Chinese investment, know-how, goods, etc. cetera, um, if, if the previous kind of uh, example is, is anything to go by. Um, the other thing I would say about the, the kind of discussion about New Zealand's, the contemporary discussion about New Zealand's economic diversification and the comparison with, with, um, uh, between China now and Britain as it was and that, and that dependence. Um, it, it may be more fruitful kind of into the future to, to think about the, the sustainability um, debate and the need to kind of diversify economically into more sustainable industries, um, et cetera, because the first round of economic diversification was, you know, a, a New Zealand Inc. project, which included sometimes, you know, the farming community was sort of seen as, as kind of laggards in, in that respect, but actually there's been some good work showing that, that farming groups, producer boards, federated farmers are quite often pushing the New Zealand government to be more, um, to open access, etc. And if there's a similar kind of mobilisation of, of um, uh, New Zealand Inc. around sustainability now um, uh, as there was to, to kind of diversifying, finding new markets um, uh, other than Britain, then, then perhaps that, that effort might have a chance of success. Um, the, the second um, aspect I wanted to talk about is, is the kind of uh, Cold War. And I think, uh, like diversification, there are some misconceptions, perhaps, about uh, New Zealand's role in, in the Cold War. By Cold War, obviously, mean the, the competition um, between the US-led um, uh, Western Bloc and, and the Soviet Bloc. Um, because it's quite often, New Zealand's quite often positioned as being... Uh, well, there's kind of two schools of thought. New Zealand is seen as an enthusiastic part of, of the Western Bloc up until 1985 and the ANZUS row, and, and the Longy government um, kind of uh, uh, forged a supposedly independent um, foreign policy in, in a very short space of time. Or the other school of thought is that New Zealand's independence kind of grew more gradually. And I think... Um, uh, I'm probably more inclined to the latter in that I don't think that the two kind of New Zealand support of, of the West in, in the last Cold War um, and its um, kind of independence after 1985, I think there's um, much more nuance in, in those kind of two, two states than, than is often given credit. But um, I think my main point about the previous Cold War is that it, it really, the formation of blocks, um, competing blocks, really hampered um, New Zealand's efforts to diversify. And New Zealand's support uh, of the Cold War effort, such as it was, you know, it's quite often seen to be done on, on the cheap, et cetera, by our allies, I'm sure, um, never actually uh, translated. When I say never, there, there are um, kind of short-term occasions, but, but um, in a more general sense, didn't really translate into um, the, the trade benefits that that it might have done. So it's, it's worth thinking about, you know, we're heading into an era where there is um, block formation and, and greater, uh, great power competition um, that makes uh, diversifying and, and finding new markets uh, more challenging, at least if, if history is, is any guide to the effect. And then the third, the third thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is the, the history um, of New Zealand's engagement with the Pacific and, and the relation to the Cold War, because it does strike me, looking, looking at the history that New Zealand's foreign policy in, in the Pacific, even though every government kind of presents it as, as something fresh, actually there are some continuities that go all the way back, um, uh, you know, perhaps even to, to the 1870s. And during the Cold War, the Pacific, New Zealand saw the Pacific as important, at least in part, because it could go to Washington, to London, to um, 
uh, Tokyo and Brussels, etc., and say, look, we're doing our bits in our region to keep it stable, um, uh, keep it free of, of communist influence and, and so forth. Um, the problem was during the Cold War that um, as the world was seen from Washington and, and um, uh, uh, Moscow and, and uh, other uh, sort of capitals, South Pacific wasn't wasn't seen as particularly strategic important. I uh, know I'm perhaps over over generalising there, but um, it, it kind of diminished New Zealand's ability to make that case that we're doing our bit in, in the South Pacific, and so um, we would like some some kind of freer trade. And it does seem to be an important difference between the last Cold War and the, the current competition that actually the, the Pacific now is seen as um, strategic. And um, perhaps on the service, and that, that may actually benefit the Pacific, you know, we've got the US um, uh, partners in the, in the Blue Pacific and it may open up investment and um, economic opportunity and, and opportunity to adapt to climate change and so forth. Um, but there are, of course, from the previous Cold War, enough examples in the global south where strategic competition went awry and it didn't benefit a lot of regions in, in Africa or Latin America or Asia. So um, there are some cautionary tales, I would suggest, um, from, from the last um, uh, bout of, of proper tensions in, in the Cold War for the, the current day. And then I'll, I'll just um, conclude briefly on, on the trans-Tasman relationship. One thing that, that strike, struck me is kind of researching researching the, the history of this is how um, fractious it has been. Quite often, you know, when, when there's um, a problem uh, in, in the current um, discourse, a problem in the, in the relationship, um, people will sort of hark back to a time when, when the relationship was on a really good footing. Um, but actually, there, there's always been this kind of tension and, and there's um, perhaps nothing natural between... Um, uh, uh, the alliance between New Zealand and Australia on both sides, and particularly New Zealand given the asymmetry, um, uh, has, to, has to work that little bit harder. And then I'll, I'll just finish by talking a little bit about CER, which the Minister says was the, seen as the gold standard and, and in many cases, I guess, was a, a successful and enduring policy. Um, but it's important to think a little bit, particularly during the anniversary, about where CER came from. Um, and there, there were two important, um, at least in my mind, drivers for it. One was not particularly um, strategic, and it was uh, a frustration, I think, on both sides between the, the sheer amount of official hours and, and ministerial hours dedicated to negotiating um, trade agreements. The previous NAFTA, New Zealand Australia Free Trade Agreement, uh, by default had, had um, goods and services excluded. So you had to negotiate really hard against um, protected industries to actually get get the goods included. CER flipped that around and, and, and presumed all goods were included unless you negotiated them out. And it, it reduced the, um, the, the official time. So that was kind of an initial driver. And also there was, at least on the New Zealand side, and, and maybe the same is true in Australia, um, an ideological driver in that um, a number of officials in Treasury, MFAT, Industries and Commerce wanted to use CER. They were unhappy um, with the, um, the central government control and protectionism of, of the Muldoon government and wanted to sort of crack that and use CER as a lever to create a, um, a more open economy. Now, um, CER came into being during, during the Muldoon um, uh, prime ministership, um, but you could argue it was, it was kind of successful in that, and in some ways, even though the, the Rogernomic reforms, reforms are you know, heavily associated with the fourth Labour government, actually CER was the, um, the kind of paved the way for, for a lot of those reforms for a much more open um, economy. So I think it's worth thinking about in the current debate um, about you know, the future of CER and economic relations, where, um, where this came from and whether those kind of principles still apply. And I'll, I'll finish there. Can you join with me in thanking our speakers so far? <laughs> All right, so... So now we're opening it up to questions from the floor and we have quite a bit of time for you and we have roving mics. So, 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Alistair Crozier from the New Zealand China Council, uh, so you can guess what my question is going to be on. Um, thank you very much for two really interesting presentations. Um, firstly, just on a quick comment on trade diversification. I think we have to be really careful not to draw too direct a comparison between UK and 73 and China now in, in, in terms of what might happen for New Zealand trade. I think the risk of China trade being seen as this monolithic thing that's going to fall off a cliff if we take a wrong step um, is scaremongering in a, in, a, in a way, and I know you didn't, uh, you didn't say that, um, but we've, we've done a lot of uh, research in, into how um, the relationship, trade relationship with China will be far more nuanced uh, if things uh, go, go a, bit, a bit different. Uh, but my question is, is for Alan, and it relates to Australia's views on China. Uh, so you said that in the last uh, few decades of last century, it was a perfect world order for Australia in some ways, and, and now it's not. But um, China is, is now out of the box, and it's not going away anytime soon. So in terms of what Australia now wants, uh, what, what, what does China want with China? What, what does it want China to look like in 50 years that would return to, to more of that, um, you know, as perfect as you can get uh, world order? Thank you. Uh, that's that's a really uh, good and uh, and difficult uh, question, and I think it's one that we haven't, uh, and I'm talking New Zealand probably as well as Australia, given enough thought uh, to what what do we want of uh, of uh, of China? Um, well, we we're not going to get again. The sort of China that we uh, that we had, which was low key and uh, and uh, and willing to to basically let the um, the the rules of the international order be set by others. So um, whether we want it or not, uh, China as it as it grows, no, no, you can have lots of debates about. The trajectory of uh, of China's growth, but it's inconceivable that it's not going to continue to be a bloody big country and uh, one which is going to be uh, uh, critically uh, important uh, uh, to us. I, uh, so, look, I think we want a China which has learned some of the lessons of the past uh, uh, five years or so, and we're we're seeing that. The, the sort of rather crude coercive measures that it imposed on Australia uh, haven't worked and China is, you know, backing away from, uh, uh, from those. Um, uh, the um, wolf warrior diplomacy, which was such a feature of, uh, of life, that seems to, to, uh, to now have been... Um, uh, to have been um, wound back uh, a, a lot. So maybe China is learning uh, how to uh, how to operate as a as a big power. I think there is a big learning experience for China in this. Being a great power in the world does require um, different ways of of, uh, of operating. It requires. It requires patience and indulgence, and the United States, you know, learnt that during the uh, during the during the 20th century. Uh, so, look, we we want a uh, a world in which there is uh, inevitably competition. We can't have a world without uh, competition, but one in which that competition is managed uh, within agreed uh, agreed. Uh, frameworks and which is certainly not ratcheting its way up uh, towards uh, towards conflict on the you know the the, the critical issue of Taiwan uh, we Australia and everyone else I think um, uh, needs to preserve the status quo uh, for as uh, for as long as possible we all have have an interest uh, in doing that, because um, once an effort is made to uh, to resolve that by um, 
by force, which, you know, if, there, if there's one thing I'm convinced, I'm, I'm unsure of very few things in international relations, but one thing I am sure of is that if Taiwan were to make a declaration of independence or the US were to, to act in that way, that, that China would, uh, uh, would act. So we want to you know, uh, prevent that. So no, no resolution is, uh, is in sight, but, but a, uh, an orderly, um, a, an orderly um, uh, process of, you know, stepping our way through the, the next uh, 20 years is all we can hope for. Here and then there. Thank you. Kia ora koru. Um, my name is Levi Turner. I'm in um, the Pacific Regional Division at MFAT um, and I work on uh, third country engagement in the Pacific. So I don't want to ask you um, how to do my job, but I am interested in um, your thoughts on this kind of interesting window that we have where the geopolitical context has gotten, um, I suppose, a little bit bent out of shape in a general picture, but it has piqued um, a lot of countries' interest in the Pacific region so that there's kind of an influx of um, engagement from um, countries that are outside of the region who want to either increase um, their presence in the region or introduce themselves to Pacific countries. So I'm kind of interested in um, what your thoughts are as to um, how New Zealand and Australia should craft um, that engagement and what opportunities might lie in this kind of interesting window where I think, um, as you pointed out, Hamish, the, um, the theatre of the Pacific in this, not Cold War, but um, more competitive era um, is a little bit more important so, for both of you. Um, you know, th thank you for the question. I think um, Alan uh, mentioned in his uh, presentation, you know, the need for greater New Zealand Australia collaboration on uh, on the Pacific, and I think that probably goes, you know, from from what I understand, um, a lot of the the nations around the Pacific are kind of wanting that that kind of collaboration to take place, not only between New Zealand and Australia, but other other kind of um, uh, 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 um, countries with interests in, in, in the region. Um, you know, greater collaboration seems to be um, an important way forward, but I, I think it also obviously needs to be done for the right reasons, because if it's just done um, for strategic reasons without genuinely taking into account the needs of the Pacific, then um, you know, you risk re repeating some of the, m the mistakes of the past um, elsewhere around the world when you have kind of heightened strategic competition. Look, it's, 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 um, it's easy to understand that uh, for a number of the Pacific countries, this external uh, interest, whether from China or Japan or India or, or Europe, is a... Uh, is a good thing. It it, uh, it gives you a certain leverage which you uh, uh, which you haven't had uh, in in the past. It provides more uh, opportunities for uh, for economic uh, engagement and growth. It uh, helps you make your own uh, 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 your own points on climate change, for example. You've got a bigger audience uh, for uh, for all of that. But I think. As well, that within the within the Pacific, there is an understanding, uh, in the end, that these things, you know, peak and uh, and then go away, and that whatever you know the EU or the UK may be may be doing ten years time, they they may have uh, different uh, uh, different interests, but that Australia and New Zealand. Uh, will be here, uh, uh, are, are, um, are um, uh, integrated with the economies of the Pacific in a way which is never going to be true of Japan or China or, uh, or, uh, or, or the United States. And so I think all we have to do, to echo Hamish really, is to, uh, to act in ways that show we understand what the, uh, what the underlying issues and, uh, uh, and, uh, and requirements are, are to be patient, 
and uh, and to and to be uh, and to be good partners. Just one over here first. Did you want to? Do you want to ask? Oh. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Siobhan, I'm from Manatu Arere, like half the people in the room here. Um, I work in the United Nations division, and Ellen, you very rightly said that we are very two different countries, very nuanced, and long with differences continue. But I see a lot in the multilateral space and in the global context that our very nuanced and different countries, for better or worse, are seen as a given pair a lot of the time, and I was wondering if the panel could speak to the pros and cons, threats and opportunities that come from being viewed as a given pair in a lot of these contexts. Yeah, gosh, I mean, I think any New Zealander who has lived overseas and being um, uh, confused for an Australian could, could kind of um, sympathise and, and agree um, with your port, uh, point. Um, one of my board colleagues, Suze Jessup, kind of characterised it as uh, New Zealand and Australia are, are very close economically, they're reasonably close culturally, but actually quite distant politically, and I think that's kind of a, a good way of kind of... Um, uh, phrasing that, but I, I guess, you know, uh, certainly from a New Zealand point of view, greater collaboration between New Zealand and Australia, as you know, there, there's been pockets of that for a long time, but, um, uh, you know, if, if there can be greater collaboration at a political level, including in, um, you know, the United Nations and other multilateral organisations, then you would think that would be beneficial, particularly as, as you say, there's often a presumption of of uh, similar interests, even when they don't necessarily exist? I, I think this happens a lot. I mean, I know uh, my background is not in multilateral diplomacy, but um, but friends who've worked in the, in, in the field, I don't... I mean, there's just routine consultation between Australia and New Zealand on a lot of that. But on this broader issue, it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting. Um, the... the uh, uh, in the course of a long and eccentric career, I spent uh, time as the founding director of the Lowy Institute in, uh, uh, in, in Sydney. And one of the things I was determined to do was to persuade uh, Frank Lowy, the very rich person who set up the Institute, to spend some of his money on an annual poll of what Australians thought about the world, because I was so frustrated by the ability of journalists to proclaim without any uh, basis of evidence, whatever, that the Australian people thought this or thought, thought that, and there was no sort of horizontal way of tracking over time uh, changes. Uh, what, one of the questions in that every year for now 17 years or something has been, uh, has been um, a temperature gauge on how warmly Australians feel about other countries in the in the world, and uh, uh, New Zealand is far and away the country that Australians feel most uh, warmly about every every year. It's at the uh, you know five five degrees of warmth uh, higher than uh, than uh, than anyone else. Um, uh, this. Um, I don't know whether there's a, an equivalent in New Zealand. Is there, a, a, is there polling like that in New Zealand? So we, we've just completed a poll in Australia ourselves yeah. on this topic, yeah. um, and then we're repeating it here in New Zealand later this year. Okay. So we'll, be, we'll have sort of the same questions. Yeah. And there are some in there about trade. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. watch the space. Okay, so we have a question here, and then we're going to Catherine over here. Suzanne, can I just ask, what happens at 11? Do we coffee break then? Thank you. So we're just going to, if we run out of questions before 11, we can move to coffee. But otherwise, just, just be assured that there is nourishment coming. Hi, uh, my name's Beatrice and I'm with Iron Duke Partners. We're a public policy advisory firm. Um, my question is that we hear a lot about the concept of New Zealand having an inclusive trade environment. Um, but at the same time, with protectionism rising and geopolitical circumstances, we're seeing a lot of articles around the concept of friendshoring and working only with like-minded partners. 
And so my question for you is, what actually should the definition of inclusive be? Should it just be with our friends or should it be looking across the board? Um. Re really great question um, that I'm, I'm sure there are um, nearly everyone in the room is probably more qualified to, to address it than, than me. I mean, I, I think um, thinking about it, inclusivity in uh, the domestic sphere, uh, sphere in, in New Zealand is kind of an interesting, um, interesting debate because quite often there was a presumption that... Um, you know, we had a, free, uh, a social license for free trade and that, um, uh, you know, there, there was sort of bipartisan support. Um, but then the, the kind of debate and something of an anti-globalist uh, backlash against the, the TPP perhaps uh, shattered a little bit some of those illusions and encouraged um, uh, more consultation and, and so forth to, to take place to, to get more... Um, views from more New Zealanders um, involved in our trade agenda, including um, including Māori um, setting up the trade advisory groups and, and so forth. Um, thinking back in history, one of the interesting things about CER and that being established in the 1980s was, that I think, one of the first times the the, the government, MFAT and industries, the, the ministries involved did a major roadshow around the country to actually, because they were really scared of the backlash, particularly from the manufacturing sector, against CER. So they did um, a roadshow from Whangarei to, um, uh, to Invercargill to kind of get, get buy-in from that. And I think, you know, we, we, um, we all would like to see greater engagement from, from policy makers um, uh, to make sure that they've got you know, uh, they're communicating what they're doing and they got by and not only on trade but perhaps other aspects of foreign policy as well because on trade there's now quite a, quite a robust discussion going on. Uh, no, it's, good. It's, a, it's a good question, an important issue and an issue that both um, uh, the Australian and New Zealand Institute of International Affairs uh, really exist to, to do something about. I mean, both of us... Uh, the origins of both organisations was the uh, Paris Peace Conference at the end of the First World War when over lunch the British and, uh, and um, American and you know, uh, other uh, imperial uh, delegates got together and said this has been a complete catastrophe, what can we do to, to prevent it happening again? And the answer they came with, up with was that we need to engage our public much more in discussion of international, uh, international issues. So the Americans went back and formed the Council on Foreign Relations and the Brits, uh, what, you know, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which turned into Chatham House, and the Australians and New Zealanders uh, sailed back to the Antipodes and, uh, and, uh, and that was the, the origin of, of both. So this idea that we need to involve uh, uh, the public in the debate about foreign policy is very big in Australia at the moment under, uh, under the Albanese government and especially Penny Wong has a very long and important history. Catherine. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. My name's Catherine Grant. Uh, I'm a visiting fellow from the Institute of International Trade at the University of Adelaide. Thanks very much uh, to the speakers this morning on this, this panel. It's been very interesting. I had a question around values in foreign and trade policy uh, and perhaps some differences between Australia and New Zealand that I'd like uh, to ask the speakers to comment on. The minister this morning spoke to us about the important of, importance of sustainability uh, in New Zealand's trade policy, and I think that that's something that we've seen front and centre for quite a while now. Uh, but I, I would, putting it diplomatically, say that that's possibly not been the case so much in, in Australia. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to ask about um, your perception of, of, of values differences and shared values in the uh, relationship between Australia and New Zealand, how that might play out going forward and whether issues like sustainability are going to be critical when we think not only from a geostrategic point of view but also from an economic um, certainty point of view in the future. Thanks. <laughs> 
start there. Uh, another, another great question. Um, yeah, sustainability. I mean, obviously, it's it's a big part of of uh, New Zealand's uh, rhetoric on trade, and increasingly part of its its action. Although you know, some people might say uh, not not far enough. Um, um, so, yeah, comparisons w w with Australia. I mean, you would like to think there's some some common ground on sustainability, not 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 only with Australia, but with other you know um, uh, of our of our trade power, uh, partners to um, to kind of drive that forward. Um, I mean, the, the the recent storms have kind of added a, a kind of new dimension to this that, that it's not just about converting into you know um uh, more sustainable you know if you're converting into to crops and horticulture etc they're going to be destroyed periodically it creates a whole new dynamic for um for trade and, and where you go, kind of go economically um so you know i i you know i wouldn't want to comment on australian um australian's approach to sustainability and trade so i'm sure alan can kind of add to that well, the um, uh, values is one of the, the sort of differences you can trace over time in, in Australian and New Zealand foreign policy generally, and the, the anti-nuclear uh, campaign is the is the you know the best example of that from an Australian perspective. Uh, well, not from an Australian perspective, from the perspective of some Australians of a certain view, you know, this was because, uh, you know, New Zealand didn't have to face up to the hard questions because it was, you know, isolated uh, way down here, protected uh, by Australia, so it could afford values where, uh, uh, where Australia uh, couldn't. I don't myself endorse that, but that was certainly, that was certainly um, uh, been a view. Um, uh, values has not <laughs> has not been a big issue in Australian trade. I was, as you were talking, I was trying to think think back over um, uh, you know over over the uh, history. Yeah, not not much, but certainly more so. Sustainability is now uh, you know obviously it's not it's not simply a value. It's also an interest now, and one of one of the you know, the, those values, interests, things are coming together in quite new ways uh, uh, for us. The, the only, look, the only problem is that there comes a point in which uh, uh, values can also become um, a, a, a sort of a, a, a means of protectionism. And, and so you've got to, you've got to be um, uh, very... The, the, uh, very clear what trade can can do and uh, what it can't do what it should do what it uh, what it shouldn't do um, uh, you know the uh, the uh, uh, debate on the the uh, CPTPP and I must say that uh, Minister O'Connor has that rolling off his tongue more effectively and quickly and fluently than anyone I've ever I've ever uh, heard before, and certainly mm -hmm. than me. But that's going that's going to be an issue um, uh, uh, going forward in, in that as well. One last question, Rob, over here, and then you guys can there'll be time over coffee. Okay, promise. Thank you. My name is Rob Scully. I'm from the New Zealand Committee for Pacific Economic Cooperation. Um, I actually have two short questions for Alan, mainly, but I welcome uh, Hamish's comments as well. Um, I want to pick up your comment, Alan, that uh, Australia is constantly having to make choices in today's geopolitical environment on taking sides, essentially. And I would like to ask how you react and maybe how you think Australia reacts to the very determined efforts we see in the countries around us including in parts of East Asia, to avoid taking choices, making choices. And related to that, the growing chorus we're seeing around the developing world, speculation on whether it's time to revive the concept of non-alignment. And we see, for example, the Singapore Foreign Minister openly speculating at a conference on whether non-alignment might be the right choice for Singapore, which I must say surprised me. Um, and my other question is about the normative content that you mentioned of 
Indo-Pacific. And it does seem to me that there are different, that term has a different normative content for different countries, as we see with the United States, either intentionally or not. Um, Indo-Pacific effectively is a China excluding concept, whereas the ASEAN group has come out, come out and said, well, we accept Indo-Pacific only if it's an inclusive concept which does not exclude China. And again, I'd be interested in your view on that. Yeah, uh, well, well, let me, let me start. Australia stand on that is really what I wanted to ask. Uh, l let me start with uh, Indo-Pacific. I mean, you're quite right. I, ke I keep telling people um, in Australia, uh, students and others, I mean, there is no such thing as the Indo-Pacific. It does not exist. It's an invention. We've, it's an imaginary... Uh, it's an imaginary area. There's, uh, you know, and for each uh, country, uh, I think that you're quite right. There is a different Indo-Pacific. The ASEAN Indo-Pacific is different from the Australian Indo-Pacific, which is different from the Japanese uh, um, Indo-Pacific, and uh, that's fine. But each country, I think, has to make sense of it for their own. Uh, for their own purposes, as I said, Australia, bang in the middle of those two, two oceans, uh, always sort of uh, having to be conscious of, uh, of the economic environment, that um, it, it makes good sense. Less, I, I, uh, from, from New Zealand's point of view, as I, as I, uh, as I said before, and the, the degree to which it's become a normative framing rather than a geographical uh, framing uh, has complicated, uh, has complicated uh, the, uh, the debate. Um, I won't go on with that, I could, but I won't. The, the, uh, on the qu question of uh, choices and wanting to avoid choices dead right, you know, the, the uh, it's a real challenge uh, that we uh, that we face now. Um, from the Australian government's perspective, uh, I know that the minister um, Penny Wong has sort of openly said, you know, we understand that people don't want to uh, people in Southeast Asia don't want to make choices, and we we understand that we don't want the situation to uh, to to escalate to a, a, a position where, you know, existential, fundamental uh, choices are needed. But uh, one of the things, and I think it's more the Ukraine war than, than China's rise uh, has done, has been to, uh, to elevate uh, debate and discussion about the global south uh, and about non-alignment uh, in, in, into um, sort of uh, ordinary, uh, ordinary discourse after it had, uh, after it had disappeared. And we're seeing sharper differences, I think, between uh, the, you know, what used to be called the developing world or global south, or or whatever, and the uh, um, and and the rest than we've than we've seen before. So it's a world which looks, feels, you know, more like the 1960s uh, or 70s than uh, than it has for a while. Did you want to add anything? Okay, Kia ora.